In this video, we're going to talk about titration curves, we're going to talk about pKa, and buffering zones. And by the end of this, what I want you to be able to do is I want you to be able to use a titration, titration curve to determine the pKa of a molecule, to determine what at what pH an amino acid acts best as a buffer, to determine how many protonatable or ionizable, ionizable groups an amino acid has, to determine the isoelectric point of an amino acid, and finally I want you to be able to define the terms zwitter ion and amphoteric in regards to amino acids. So let's take a look at a titration curve. And this is the titration curve of acetic acid. Now acetic acid is a, a weak acid. It looks like this here. Its acidic group is the carboxyl group right here. And now because it's a weak acid, it doesn't fully deprotonate when you put it into a solution of physiological pH. Okay. So the way this works is we're going to put this solution, uh, this acetic acid, into a solution that is very low pH, such that we know that over here we have 100% protonation. And to the solution, we are going to add a little bit of strong base. And every unit of strong base that we add converts a deprotonate, uh, um, deprotonates a unit of acetic acid. Okay, so as we do that, we're going to also take a look and measure the pH. So we will add a 0.1 unit of strong base and then check the pH. Add 0.2 units and then check the pH. And then we're going to graph that as the units of strong base added as a function of the pH. And when you do that, you get a graph that looks like this. Now, one complete unit or equivalent will titrate out or deprotonate one unit of the acetic acid. So by the time that we're done here, 100% of the molecules are deprotonated. All right, so now if we know here 100% of the molecules are deprotonated, and we know here 100% of the molecules are protonated, we know that half of this, okay, so not a full unit, but half a unit will be the state at which half of the molecules are protonated and half of the molecules are deprotonated, 50-50. Now we know something special about this. At this point, right, in solution, when we know that the amount or concentration of protonated is equal to the concentration of deprotonated state, we know at that point the pKa of that molecule is equal to the current P. H. So how do we figure out the pKa from this graph? Well, we know 100% protonated, 100% deprotonated, go to half of the equivalents, go up until you hit the curve, go over to see what the current pH is, and that current pH is about 4.76, which means the pKa of acetic acid is 4. 0.76. Now another thing that we that that is illustrated here is that acetic acid or all weak acids for that matter can work as a buffer. And remember, buffers minimize changes in pH. Meaning that if you add some acid or if you add some base to a buffered solution, the pH isn't going to change very much. And what you can see here is the acetic acid can work as a buffer, but it doesn't work as a buffer at all pHs, right? Take a look at this. At pH 2, when you add just 0.1 equivalents of a strong base, look at how far up the pH goes, from 2 to almost 4, almost 2 units. That is most definitely not acting as a buffer there. But now let's take a look when we're looking more 
closer to pH 4, pH 5. Here we are, uh, just over pH 4. We add an equivalent, a 0.1 equivalent of buffer, the same amount that we added here. We're added here, and look at that. It's only going up in pH maybe, I don't know, one-fifth of a pH unit or something like that. So it's in this flattened region, this flattened region where acetic acid is going to work best as a buffer. And you'll notice this region, and this isn't coincidence, this region is centered upon the pKa of acetic acid, the pH, right, equal to the pKa. And then if you add one unit above and one unit below, that will give you what's called the buffering region of acetic acid. So if it's 4.76 is the pKa, then that means in pH is 3.76 to 5.76, that is the buffering region of uh, acetic acid. Anything outside of those pHs no longer work as a buffer. You essentially broke the buffer. Now, the question I'm going to ask you and that what I want you to think about is why is it that the best buffering capacity of acetic acid, or of any weak acid for that matter, is centered on a pH that is equal to its pKa. Okay, I want you to think about that, and we can discuss that um, sometime. All right, now, that was acetic acid. And acetic acid has just one protonatable group. Amino acids, every single amino acid has at least two protonatable groups. It's got this alpha carboxyl group here, which can be in a protonated state or a deprotonated state. And it has our alpha amino group, which can be in a protonated state or a deprotonated state. Well, it turns out because of the pKa's of the amino group, the pKa of the alpha carboxyl group, that under physiological pH, um, the amino acids exist as what is called a zwitter ionic state. Our uh, alpha amino group is protonated and therefore positively charged. The alpha carboxyl group is deprotonated and therefore negatively charged. Okay. And so if you were to take a look at the concentrations of each one of these forms of, this is glycine, for example. So the form where everything is protonated, where one is deprotonated and the other is protonated, and where everything is deprotonated, so pink, pink, blue, blue, green, green, and we graph this out as a concentration as a function of pH, we get this interesting look here, right? As both are protonated, but as you increase the pH, the um, alpha carboxyl group becomes deprotonated, and so this is going to increase. As you keep increasing the pH, suddenly now, even the alpha amino group is gonna become deprotonated, and so the double deprotonated group increases. Here's something else. Here's some homework here. What I want you to do is I want you to use this information here, no other information out there, and I want you to determine what is the pKa of the alpha carboxyl group and the alpha amino group, just using this, eyeballing this data here. There's a very specific way to solve this, and I want you to work on that. Okay, amino acids, because they are in this zwitter ionic state at physiological pH, they are referred to as amphoter amphoteric. And what that means is at physiological pH, amino acids can act both as an acid and a base. So here, and this is counterintuitive, it's our carboxyl group and physiological pH is usually deprotonated, which means it can act as a base. Uh, excuse me, we're looking at our amino group. Our amino group here can act as an acid. So that amino group can donate a proton. Under physiological conditions, our carboxyl group here is deprotonated, and therefore it can accept a proton to become protonated. So it's reducing the concentration of hydrogen ions, and our amino group is increasing 
or can increase the concentration of hydrogen ions. So amino acids are amphoteric because they can act as both an acid and a base in physiological pH. Now that we are looking at molecules that have more than one protonatable or ionizable groups, like uh, like glycine, for example. So we're looking at now we're looking at the titration curve of glycine. What you can see is now to titrate out a glycine molecule. Not only do you need to deprotonate all of the carboxyl groups, but you also need to deprotonate all of the amino groups. So instead of needing one equivalent of strong base, you need two equivalents. One equivalent will titrate out first the ionizable group that has the lower pKa, right? That's the one that doesn't hold on to its proton as strongly as the other one. And then that second equivalent is going to be titrating out the uh, ionizable or the protonatable group that has the higher of the two pKa's. That's the one that holds on to the proton more strongly, and you really need to decrease the proton concentration to have it give up its proton. And so what you see then with a, a, a molecule like glycine with two protonatable groups, you'll see two pKa's, right? A pKa here. So if we go to one equivalent, that is going to 100% deprotonate our carboxyl group. And so half of that right here, so the pH, whoops. So the pH then um, is 2.34, which means the pKa of the carboxyl group is 2.34. Four. Then from one to two, we're titrating out the amino group. So you go half of one to two is 1.5, go up, and then over, and you see right around pH 9.6 is the point at which uh, we are at 1.5 equivalents of OH, which means the pKa of the alpha amino group is 9.6. Furthermore, that means glycine has two discrete buffering regions. A buffering region centered around the pKa, the pH equal to the pKa of the alpha carboxyl group, and a buffering region centered around the pH equal to the pKa of the alpha amino group. Right? So it can act as a buffer here between, say, one and 3.3 uh, pH, and it can act as a buffer between 8.6 and 10.6 pH, okay? All right, next, another thing that we can determine once we start looking at molecules with more than one protonatable groups is a term called the isoelectric point. And the isoelectric point of a molecule is the pH at which the net charge on that molecule is zero. So let's take a look at glycine again. Now glycine can exist in three different states, and we can look at them starting in the lowest pH. So we can pretend like this is the lowest pH, and then we've increased the pH, and we've increased the pH. And what you can see when you do that is you go from a double protonated state to a state at which the carboxyl group becomes deprotonated, but the amino group, its pKa is higher, so it's still protonated. But then if you keep increasing the pH, now you are at the double deprotonated state. Okay, now let's look at those three forms and see which one has a net charge of zero. Well, this has a net charge of one. This has a net charge of negative one. Aha, this one right here where the carboxyl group has become deprotonated, but the alpha amino group is still protonated. Positive one plus negative one is zero. Okay, well, that happens to be right here, right? That happens to be right between the pKa of this and the pKa of this, which means we want as many of those carboxyl groups to be deprotonated as possible. So we want it to be over pH 2.34. But here's the problem. If we go too far over 2.34, we start to also deprotonate our alpha amino group. 
So what's going to end up happening is we want to be as far away from 2.34 as possible, but we also want to be under, as far under 9.6 as possible. And the best way to approach that is just to take the average of the two. 2.34 plus 9.6 divided by 2 is 5.97. Now, why do we want to know the isoelectric point of a molecule? Because that gives us a tool. If we have dissolved that molecule in a solution where the pH is above the isoelectric point, Okay, the pH is above the isoelectric point. That means we have less and less protons, so it's going to become deprotonated, meaning it's going to have a net negative charge. When the pH is below the isoelectric point, that means we have lots and lots of protons. That molecule is going to be more often protonated, so it will have a net positive charge. So knowing the isoelectric point will give us a benchmark for knowing when a molecule is in a solution and we know the pH of that solution and we know the isoelectric point, we can get a feel for what the net charge on that molecule is. There are seven amino acids that not only have an alpha carboxyl group, not only have an alpha amino group, but they have an R group with an ionizable group, with a protonatable group. And I want you to know each one of these seven amino acids, and we'll look at them a little more carefully in a second. And if you look, let's take a look. I want to teach you how to read this table now. Here's a table with all 20 amino acids. This is a table that you should get to know well. It will be on the exam. Here's the three-letter abbreviation of each amino acid. Here's the single letter abbreviation of each amino acid. Be careful, the first letter is not always the single letter abbreviation. Uh, spartate here, for example, its single letter is D. Um, this is the molecular weight of each amino acid. This, PK1, is the isoelectric point of the alpha carboxyl group. This, PK2, is the iso, um, the PK of the alpha amino group. And this, PKR, is the PKA of the R group of the amino acid. And notice, most of the amino acids don't have a number here because they don't have any functional group that is ionizable or protonatable in the R group, in the side chain. But seven of them do. Tyrosine, cysteine, lysine, histidine, arginine, aspartate, and glutamate. Okay. And, of course, it gives us the isoelectric point of each of these amino acids. Now, let's take a look at the R groups of those seven amino acids, because what I want you to know is that when it's in its ionized state, is it negatively charged or is it positively charged? That is what you are going to have to memorize. So notice, spartic acid and glutamic acid, they both have carboxyl groups. So it's in their deprotonated state where it carries a negative charge. Histidine has this imidazole group. It's in its protonated state where it carries a positive charge. Cysteine has a sulfhydryl group. It is in its negative charge when it's deprotonated. Tyrosine, very similar. It's got a hydroxyl group. Only when it's deprotonated does it carry a negative charge. Lysine's got an amino group. When it's protonated, it carries a positive charge. And arginine has this group here. When it's protonated, it carries a positive charge. So you've got to know whether that R group is going to be negatively or positively charged um, when it's ionized, and whether it has to be protonated or deprotonated to carry that charge. Study up on this table. Okay, so let's take a look at one of these more complex amino acids. We've got histidine here. It's a pretty important amino acid for lots of different proteins, especially enzymes. And immediately what you can see is that not only does it have an alpha carboxyl group, not only does it have an alpha amino group, but this group right here, this imidazole group, when it's protonated, carries a positive charge. And because we have one, two, three protonatable groups, we get one, two, three of those flattening 
of those slopes. And remember, and I'll go into the next slide here, remember that if the molecule we're looking at only has one protonatable group, it only takes one equivalent of strong base to titrate it out. When a molecule has two, like glycine, protonatal groups, it'll take one, two equivalents to titrate it out. Well, histidine has three protonatable groups, and so it's going to take one, two, three equivalents of strong base to, pro, uh, to titrate it out, to completely deprotonate it. And the order at which that is going to occur depends upon the pKa's of each one of these groups. Well, it turns out that the alpha carboxyl group has the lowest, 1.82. The right pKr has the second lowest, pKr, R being the R group, here at 6. And the alpha amino, pK2, has 9.17. So the way you would figure out those pKa's is, all right, well, let's look at the carboxyl group. Here is that one equivalent. We go to half of that, we hit the line, go over, and whatever that pH is, that's our pK1. That's our pKa of the alpha carboxyl group. Between the 1 and 2, we go half of that, go up until we hit the curve, go over, boom. There's our pH6, so we know the pKa of the R group must be about 6. Then we go our third unit, 2 to 3, half of that is up here. Go up till we hit the curve, go over, pH, oh, it looks like about 9.17. That means the pKa of the alpha amino group is 9.17. Now, let's ask uh, another interesting question. At what pH is histidine the worst buffer? Uh -huh. A buffer is defined as a solution that minimizes changes in pH. When you add acid or base, it's not going to go up or down very quickly. That means the opposite of a buffer is that when you add acid or base, you are really going to increase or decrease that pH quite a bit. So what you're looking for are vertical lines where that line is going way up in a short amount of, of uh, um, space. So there's pretty so right around pH 4. Four is pretty bad there. Right around here, maybe around pH 8, uh, it's not acting as a very good buffer. In fact, it's a horrible buffer. Okay, at what pH is histidine the best buffer? Well, that's going to be when it flattens out. That's going to be when you add some base, it doesn't go up in pH very much. So that's, and you already know, it's going to be centered around the pKa of each of the three protonatable groups. So around two, around six, and around nine is where it's going to be the best buffer. And finally, what is the isoelectric point of histidine? That's a little tricky. It's a little trickier than doing it for glycine. And so I'm gonna demonstrate that for you. Okay, to get the isoelectric point um, of something, the first step you need to do is to identify all of the protonatable groups, determine what the pKa of each of those protonatable groups are, and then arrange them in ascending order. Okay, so let's do that then with histidine. So first is we have a uh, carboxyl group That is uh, the alpha carboxyl group, and that has a pKa of 1.82. Next, we have the imidazole group that looks like this when protonated. And that has, and that's on the R group, and that has a pKa of 6. And finally, there is the alpha amino group. Whoops. The alpha amino group that has a pKa of 9.17. Now, remember what we're trying to do is we're trying to determine the isoelectric point. That is the point at which the net charge on that histidine, on that molecule, is zero. So here is what you do next. Make yourself a little table. 
Uh, okay. And then what we're going to do is we are going to pretend to put this histidine molecule in solutions of different pHs. So let's start with putting um, this histidine in a pH, and you always start with a pH that is lower than the lowest pKa. So let's say that it is, let's say, 1. So now up top here, this is our pH. Okay, so let's take a look at the protonation and therefore the charge of each one of these groups in pH 1. And pH 1, that's lower than this pKa, so this is going to be protonated, so it's not going to have a charge. 1 is much lower, so pH 1 is much lower than the pKa here, which means this is all going to be protonated, so that's going to carry a positive charge. And the pH, of course, is going to be much, pH 1 is much lower than the pKa of 9.17, and therefore this is going to be protonated and positively charged. So that means at pH 1, the net charge on the molecule is going to be 0 plus 1 plus 1 is plus 2. Now, plus 2 is not 0, so we don't have 1 is not the isoelectric point. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to increase the pH such that we deprotonate all of this while keeping this and this protonated, which means we're going to go to a pH somewhere between 1.82 and 6. Let's go at 4. So pH 4. pH 4 is now significantly higher than this pKa, which means, remember our benchmark here, if the pH is 2 units above the pKa, then 99% of those molecules are going to be deprotonated, which means we are at C uh, COO minus, so that is minus. 4 is still significantly less than 6. That stays protonated. That stays protonated. So we have a plus 1 here. We have a plus 1 here. Minus 1, plus 1, that's 0, plus 1. So now we're at plus 1. Again, that is not the isoelectric point. So now, let's move to a point where we, a pH where we know this is deprotonated. And we know this is going to be deprotonated, but this is still going to stay protonated. So we want a pH that is above 6.0, but below 9.17. Let's call it maybe 7 or so. pH 7. Okay. pH 7 way above the pKa of 1.82, so we know that's deprotonated. pH 7 is now above 6, so now we've deprotonated this. And now when you deprotonate this, D, uh, this imidazole group, it goes to N and doesn't carry a charge. So that's 0. 7 is less than 9.17. This remains protonated. Right? That was, that's why we chose pH 7 here. And so then we have N. Oops, we have NH3+, plus, so that is a positive. Negative plus zero plus positive is zero. Now, now we are at or close to the isoelectric point. It's a pH that is going to be above six, but below nine. 0.17 because as we go above 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 6 that's great that's what we want because we want to deprotonate as much of this as possible we need it at 0 but we don't want to go too far above 6 because the farther and farther and farther above 6 we get the closer and closer to 9.17 and we start to deprotonate this and we don't want that to happen we want all of that deprotonate uh, we want all of this deprotonated but as much of this as possible protonated so what pH is the best? It's going to be right in between 6 and 9.7. So that's going to be 6.0 plus 9.17 divided by 2 
equals 7.58. That is the isoelectric point of the histidine molecule. All right, so let's come back to the learning outcomes. Make sure that you can describe what a titration curve is, how it's graphed. Be sure that you can use a titration curve to determine these things, the pKa of a molecule, the pH of a molecule, how many protonable, protonable groups are on that molecule, and what is the isoelectric point of that molecule. Now we've done it for amino acids and that's really where the focus is going to be. Finally, I want you to define what a sphitter ion is and what the term amphoteric means in regards to amino acids.